we are so glad to have him with us tonight. I've been uh, benefiting from listening to a lot of his information, and we're looking forward to hearing more tonight. The author of one of the most important books ever written, and the name of that book, of course, is Not in His Image. And with that, we want to welcome in my friend, Mr. John Lamb Lash. How are you, John? I'm pretty well, thank you. Ever since you started, mentioned the term Gnostic sabotage, and that was in one of your talks on, on Revelation. As I go through the New Testament in my normal course of study, I'm seeing other things, John, that if I didn't know better, I would have to swear that they are also instances of Gnostic sabotage. And I'm almost wondering, did the Gnostics have, did they successfully infiltrate the Roman-led writers of the New Testament? And I guess the quick question, and I'll turn the baton and let you take the show from here, is how extensive do you think the Gnostic sabotage was in the New Testament? That's an excellent question, Jeffrey. Excellent. I can only say that to the extent of my investigation and the evidence that I have found, I have detected one unique case in the book of Revelation specifically. Now, there may be others. Uh, for instance, I'm edging out into territory here. This is supposition. <laughs> But, you know, when I first started working with Gnosticism, I still had, in many respects, the malware. And so for a long period of my life, and I, I described this in some of my writings, I was working with a rather Christocentric spin of Gnosticism. And so I played with the idea, there's some essays on Nemeta that go into this in depth. I played with the idea that, well, maybe, you know, could Jesus have been a Gnostic or could, it, could the Gnostics have somehow influenced the scripting of that figure exactly as you propose, okay? For instance, the saying, uh, being wise, be wise as serpents. Mm. That's a very Gnostic saying, because in the Gnostic interpretation of Genesis, the serpent is actually the divine ally and advisor of Adam and Eve and not an evil satanic influence, you see? So it's possible, but uh, anyone who wants to go to my channel, John Lamb Lash, can hear the series I'm doing on Gnostic sabotage, and there are 10 talks. And the 10th one is yet to come. That's on the Great Horror of Babylon. So as far as I know, there was a unique instance when three refugees from the mysteries who were fleeing the Middle East encountered the monk who wrote the book of Revelation. And they influenced some of what he put into it. So that is the case that I can verify i don't have any other verifiable examples but you may be onto something there well it's it as, as i look through and and see it i just it really comes to my mind and makes me wonder but uh john i'm very excited to hear uh what you have planned tonight you said that you had already put some things down and my wife is so excited to to have you to have you come back on and i know the rest of our audience is too so we just want to go ahead and uh give the con to you well, thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going back to Alexandria Ooh. to begin the talk, to begin the program. And uh, we're going to meet a woman from the mysteries this evening. So I thought it appropriate to put my avatar up, which is a Balinese dancer, okay, in full costume. She's lovely. Yes, yeah, she is indeed. And I wanted to correct something that I said. One of your callers, I think her name was June, said that hearing the Gnostic message makes her want to dance. Dance is, uh, is a practice in Gnosticism. We do dance. And uh, there is a, an art of dancing that has a kind of shamanic uh, spin to it. Anyway, I quoted Nietzsche. And now I can quote exactly what he said. He said, and those who were seen dancing 
were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. Mm. Right. Beautiful saying. And now I'm going to introduce you to another dancer. So we go back to uh, the Agora. We go back to a park or a place, public place, just outside the campus of the Mystery School in Alexandria. And there's another conversation going to happen now with Justin. So he arrives and he sits down. He's a little bit nervous, but he's bracing himself because he knows that the Bible is the spoken word of God. And scripture is the only truth. And he's going to stand up against these evil, deviant Gnostics, these know-it-alls. That's what they use. That's what Gnostic really means. These smart asses who think mm. they know better. And he's going to make his case this time, right? So he sits there. The crowd gathers around. And they're looking around. And then they see coming from the great colonnade of the school, a young woman walking toward them. She's about 24 years old. She has on the attire of the mystery school teachers and the signature, the long scarf. And uh, there are a shockwave goes through the crowd, of course. What is a woman doing here? Arguing with one of the Christian fathers, right? Wow. So she comes and she sits down across from him. And uh, she has a little handbag, which has some things in it. And she introduces herself. And she says, hello, I'm Lydia of Damascus. And I teach sacred dance and ritual Ooh. in the Alexandrian University. She teaches what they call theurgia or theurgy. It's made up of two words, thea meaning divine and Urgos, meaning uh, a work, an operation to do something, a performance. So theurgy is the performance of divine acts or acts that connect us to the divine. She says, so I teach theurgy and a uh, sacred dance. I'm a dancer and uh, I'm going to be here because uh, Damascus has a, a special appointment with some students this afternoon. So she's there sitting across from Justin. You can picture this. There's a little wind blowing through the Agora. and mm. Her beautiful, long, wavy hair is sort of moving in the breeze. And the crowd is just like, oh, oh. they don't know what to make of this woman. And so, of course, there are rumors that she might be like that evil Hypatia, you know, a witch, an evil witch who beguiles men with her clever tongue and her looks you know so they're all agitated by her presence and the conversation begins and so justin immediately goes on the offensive and he says dancing yes we know about your dancing we know the sin that you perform when you dance and we know about you and your orgies we know because of Epiphanius. And she says, yeah, right, she nods. Yeah, I know who Epiphanius is. When he was about 20, he came to us. And um, he confessed to us sincerely that he wanted to be a member of a mystery cell. So he was taken in. But then it turned out that he was actually uh, a spy. And he went out and uh, wrote a book reporting on what we did in our mystery cells. And she kind of laughs about that. And she says, yeah, we, uh, we know what he said about us. We know what he said about our sexual practices and things like that. And uh, so it's already starting off uh, pretty hot. Uh, and some of the... Some of the new Christians in the crowd, you know, the workers, the low class slaves are kind of tucking themselves into their dirty tunics because they don't want to show that they're getting a bit aroused and excited by the sight of this beautiful woman. You see, that would be shameful. So am I setting the scene pretty well? <laughs> it's very vivid. I feel like I'm there myself. I can feel the breeze and I'm just waiting on the edge of my seat for the conversation. So 
Lydia says, well, got some topics to talk about tonight. I have the list here from your previous conversation of the six points. Uh, and what I'd like to talk about tonight is uh, this figure of Jesus, you uh -huh. know, your Messiah and so forth. That's number five on the list. She says, but before I do that, did you know that that Jesus was also a dancer? Oh. Yeah. And Justin goes, well, in scripture, show me, show me in scripture. No, that's that's not possible. Dancing is a pagan thing. We don't do that, you see. So she says, well, it's written in your own books. And she reaches into her bag and she pulls out a scroll. Remember, they all had scrolls then. They called scrolls books. It, what, they didn't make them into books until the Nag Hammadi codices. Hmm. Did, you, did you know that the Nag Hammadi codices, which apparently were constructed as books bound in leather around 325 A.D., are the oldest surviving examples of bound books from the ancient world. I did not know that. Yeah, that's a fact. Uh, mostly we have parchment, papyrus, vellum, and scrolls. So she pulls out a scroll and she says, here, look, haven't you seen this? It's a document in Greek and it's called the Acts of John. And he says, oh, well, we might have heard of that. I think so, yeah, but that's apocryphal. We know what apocryphal means, right, don't we, Jeffrey? We do. Whatever doesn't go along with the narrative, whatever we don't want people to know, we just trash it, stash it, or burn it, right? Absolutely. But at the time the conversation took place, there was a lot of apocryphal literature floating around. And if found, anyone wants to research, you go to New Testament Apocrypha, which is two volumes edited by, hold on a minute, one of those evil Germans, Wilhelm Schneemelcher. And it's two thick volumes of all of these deeply detailed, fascinating accounts that could have been in the New Testament, but they're not. Hmm. So Lydia knows all this, you know, because she's well trained in theology, as all Gnostics are. So she says, yeah, I know that you decided that you uh, didn't want to include this. But nonetheless, it's a contemporary document. It's written in Greek. It dates from about 110 A.D. And look what it says. It says that John, you know, that's your John, Justin. Your John was attending the Last Supper on Maundy Thursday. You know when, you know about that event, right? Yes, of course. The disciples were assembled in the upper room and the Lord gave them his flesh to eat and his blood to drink. And that was the sanctification of the faith before he performed the ultimate sacrifice of atonement, right? And Lydia's nodding and smiling and she's saying, yeah, that's your version. But what does John say in the Acts of John? Well, he says that he gathered with the other disciples and some women, including a woman called Mary Magdalene, mm. in the upper room. I'm quoting this, by the way, paraphrasing what's actually in this document. And John says it didn't happen that way at all. He says that they gathered together and they celebrated and they were very, very happy. And it was like there was nothing bad going to happen. Nothing bad was going to come in the next two days on Easter Friday, Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. They were all euphoric. And the reason why they were euphoric was because this woman, Mary Magdalene, had an alabaster vase. And in that vase, she had some of the rarest ointment that you could buy in the Middle East at that time. Spikenard, oil of spikenard, which is still very rare to this day. And in order to celebrate Maundy Thursday in the upper room, she anointed the feet 
of Jesus with this oil, and that was a sacred rite, and then they did a sacred dance together. And John describes yeah. this dance, and he even gives the hymn. It's called the Round Hymn of John, and he even gives the hymn that they sang. And she says to him, I have it right here in the scroll. Look, would you like to hear a few lines of this hymn? So like Justin is like paralyzed and freaking out. And he's thinking, well, I don't really want to hear this, but she is citing some kind of scripture. So I better let her get away with it just so I can refute it, right? You, you get the reasoning. So here are six lines that she reads from the document. Grace dances, grace dances. Mm. I would play the pipe so ye all dance. The number eight singeth praise with us. The number 12 danceth on high. The whole entirety on high has part in our dancing. Whoever does not enter the dance does not know what is happening. Mm. These are the actual lines from this document. And so uh, he says, he, he's just speechless. I mean, what can you say? Here is something in a Christian document that celebrates dancing as a divine right. And the central figures of the right are a man and a woman. Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Yeah, that's one of the key documents in the legend of Mary Magdalene, which I specialized in for many years, by the way. And John, I'm reminded of the Jesus character himself uh, as you're talking about this subject where he says uh, in the Gospels, he said, I piped for you and you would not dance. Well, it says here, grace dances. I love that. That grace, you know, the act of grace. Grace Absolutely. is a dance. And I would pipe this dance for you. So dance ye all. So it's an invitation to the dance, the it cosmic is. dance. There is a specific reference in here. Why does it say the number eight singeth praise with us? Well, eight is the number of the Gnostic mystery cell. I've proven that. And why does it say the number 12 dances on high? Well, the Gnostics had various figures of how many aeons there were in the Pleroma or the galactic center. Some are as high as 400, some say 30, some say 12. Hmm. So that is a reference to the source. And our source, our cosmic source, is the galactic center, the Pleroma. So there is verifiable Gnostic elements in this passage, right? So the crowd is really getting agitated now and they're whispering and mumbling to each other and they're saying, this is too much, you know, I think, you know, maybe we're going to have to go strangle that bitch, you know, this kind <laughs> of thing, right? This is how Absolutely. they do it, right? Yeah. She's too beautiful. She's a temptress. She's charming us with her looks and with her evil, heretical, know-it-all bullshit. You know, we better take her out right now, right? So it's getting a little scary, but uh, Lydia is a courageous woman. She holds her own, and she even decides to double down. Now, hold on to your panties, folks, because I'm sure you've never heard what I'm going to tell you now. Okay? So she says, oh, yes, uh, it's really harmless, you know, dancing. And she kind of waves it off with her, her arm, right? And Justin says, well, yes, dance perhaps, but you do other vile things as well. Epiphanius told us what you do. And she smiled and she said, yes, I know. I have a document right here that confirms what Epiphanius said about us doing sexual practices in our mystery cells. And she reaches in and she pulls out another scroll. And she says, you know, this scroll is called The Questions of Mary. Have you ever seen this? And Justin like shudders and he says, I've heard of it, but it's obscene. I wouldn't even go and look at it. We know that you have obscene writings. 
And she says, no, 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 no. This is not a Gnostic writing. This is an early Christian document. It comes out of your fold. And this is what it says. It says that one of you is talking about something that happened with Jesus and Mary. So this is a report coming from your people, Justin, about things that they narrate about Jesus and Mary. It's coming from your people. And so she says, and I quote, the authors of the questions of Mary, which is a legitimate document that you can find in New Testament Apocrypha, she says, oh, and they too, the Gnostics, have so many books and they publish a certain scroll called the questions of Mary. And they offer many other books about Eldabaoth and about the children of Seth, right? So it's a Christian talking about the Gnostics. It's not a Gnostic, right? And so the text goes on and says, and those Gnostics have scrolls such as the Apocalypse of Adam, and they have ventured to compose other scrolls. And they are not ashamed to describe Jesus Christ, our Lord himself, and to reveal obscenities. And so in the questions of Mary, they claim that Jesus reveals to Mary Magdalene a mystery when he takes her aside on the mountain and he produces a woman from his side hmm. and he begins to have sex with this double woman. And then he turns to Mary Magdalene and bids her partake of his emission ritually and he says to her this we must do that we may live end quote wow yeah have you heard that one before i have not heard that one before john jesus inviting mary magdalene to oral sex on a mountainside these are the kind of things that were not put in the new testament right <laughs> Well, I can I mean, see your expression. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, and I, I often say things that I shouldn't, but it, it confirms to me that, you know, they say spitters aren't quitters, and I'm sure that Mary Magdalene wasn't a quitter. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's hot stuff. But the point I'm trying to make is that this conversation, and we'll come back to the present now, but this conversation simply illustrates the fact that if that conversation had happened, the Gnostics would have been able to cite the documents of the early Christians themselves to refute them. It explains a lot, absolutely. So, enough about sex. <laughs> now, what I'd like to talk about is supernatural events and the figure of Jesus. Ooh. Because uh, isn't it true that you could consider the figure of Jesus to be, in a way, a supernatural figure. Absolutely. Well, Jesus is not exactly ordinary Joe Sixpack, is he? Not in the least. Now, here I have to rely on your expertise and also your assessment, knowing many more Christians than I do. Is it fair to say that you know, there was in the early Christian centuries a lot of argument about the divinity of Jesus. You know that. It wasn't really argument... accepted and confirmed until probably low fourth century, late third ish. Yeah, but that's when the Arian heresy happened and when the Arian heresy split the church, right? Right. And that was an argument between, let me see if I get it right, homoousia e homoiousia. So the argument was, is Christ of the same substance of the Father, or is he of similar substance? That's the Arian heresy. That is indeed. Right. And so a certain Arian bishop named Euphilus was thrown out of the church in Constantinople because he didn't believe that Jesus was physically materially divine 
And he is the bishop who actually, <clears throat> excuse me, went off to the Goths and to the hinterlands of beyond the Danube and into the interior of uh, Europe. And he converted, uh, in, in uh, quotes, those people to Arian heresy. He didn't convert them to Athanasian heresy, which is the basis of the belief that Jesus is divine, that physically he is some kind of divine supernatural entity. So question is, do Christians today or some Christians regard the figure of Jesus in the New Testament as kind of a divine human hybrid? You know, that's an excellent question. You might get as many answers as people that you asked, but I think, you know, based on 40 years of being around them, or at least 25 years of close contact, that when people think in their mind about it, the answer to that, I think, is yes. Whether they, whether they would enunciate it in their spoken theology or not, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's looming in the background of their minds, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, there's always that, of course how would you test that? How would you know? But uh, I would say that it's fair to say that that concept, a human divine hybrid is associated with the figure of Jesus. So you can say that he's a supernatural being and indeed he performs supernatural acts, right? That's what the story tells us. Raising of Lazarus, healing of healing of different people, multiplication of the bread and the fishes, turning water to wine. These are supernatural acts, right? If I, if I turn water to wine, I'm a satanic Gnostic uh, <laughs> monster, right? Right. Practicing black magic, right? But if Jesus does it, it's, it's, it's okay. It's proof that he's divine, right? It's just like if you're outside of a church, John, and you accept a spirit into your heart, you've just participated in demonization. But if you're inside a church and you accept a spirit called the Father and another spirit called the Son into your heart, now it's holy. There you go. How do they keep, how does that keep together without just falling apart? I've it's been asking myself business. that for <laughs> so long, John. I bet so you, long. I bet, I bet you have. So, you know, there's a word I encountered early on. Actually, it was when I was studying anthroposophy. I was in anthroposophy for a long time. With Rudolf Steiner. Yeah, the Steinerites, the anthropops. And, you know, they're extremely Christos, Christocentric. Well, I know that now from listening to your talk earlier today in the infrared sauna. Yeah, I described, you know, I don't, uh, I don't make any bones about it or I don't... Uh, you know, hedge words on the path that I took to get where I am today to speak in the way I speak. I know that it sounds arrogant to some people, but it's just my confidence. You know, I'm very confident. I don't know it all. Gnostics were not know-it-alls, but what they knew, they knew with great confidence and deep, deep foundations, you know. Absolutely. Uh, but I, yeah, I went through uh, a very, I went through a labyrinth of stuff. And what, how I would describe anthroposophy now is that if there's someone who wants to get out of Orthodox Christianity or Catholicism, you know, it's like being a drug addict. They're addicts, right? Yes. Religious addicts. So what do you do with a drug addict? Well, you put them in a halfway house. So Steinerian philosophy and mysticism is kind of a halfway house for those who want to get out of conventional Christianity. John, that's a just became an upcoming sh uh, show on this channel, Christian halfway houses. Yeah, that's right. And that one is very convincing because uh, you can still have your Christ figure but it's sort of like, I used to call it underground Christianity or alternative Christianity. And I think I wrote a whole chapter on it in my book, The Seeker's Handbook in 1991. So you go to alternative types of Christianity when you want to get out of the big congregation of addicts, right? And I, I went to the halfway house. I, I don't have anything to hide. 
And for a long time, I still had, I wanted to make Christ over into something else that I could handle, that I could uh, accept. And I think that might be fairly common in many Christians if they are troubled with the way they find Christ presented in the hardline religion. I think that is, and I myself, you know, I was hardcore Pentecostal Christianity, and then I found a halfway house in what is known as the sacred names and the feast keeping movement. And then I found another cup halfway house and what I was calling new covenant Kabbalah. So I went through a few halfway houses and I'll make this statement, John, I would welcome your input on it. I, I have decided after now over 40 years of study across this spiritual spectrum and specifically in Christianity, the reason for these halfway houses and the reason for these undercover Christianity, strong statement, but I'm convinced that there is an adrenochrome like addiction to blood. And even though they know that it's not something they want to stay into, they're still addicts, John Lamb Lash. And they can't quit him. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, adrenochrome. Well, we're not going to go there this evening, but we <laughs> certainly can go there if you want no, to. No, 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 please. Uh, I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, it's, uh, I would say, and again, this is based on study of psychology, physiology, neurogenetics, neuropsychology. Uh, it's a dopamine hit. Yes. It's a dopamine hit to be in these religious congregations. You know, the word worship, uh, what does it come from? Well, it's an, like an old Anglo-Saxon word, and it has the same root as the word worth. Worth. So why do people go into congregations and worship? Because they get from that participation a sense of worth which is a dopamine hit. Like people get when they get a thumbs up or they get a positive on their, uh, uh, what is it, on their Facebook page. You get right. a dopamine hit, right? You know that story. It was, uh, Facebook was invented to deliver dopamine hits and get people addicted, right? And it's well, religion, religion is, Yeah, your religion is the same thing. So moving on, uh, I was saying when I was in the Steiner uh cult and i was a very unusual figure in the steiner cult i never joined the movement i was considered to be uh, a maverick that came out of nowhere and because i was a fast talker and because i basically read everything that steiner wrote and i i could talk my way around veteran steinerites who'd been in the movement for 30 or 40 years they accepted me but there was a rumor that I was the Antichrist. Uh, there was a rumor that I was Aruman, <laughs> which is their version of Satan. And I was a notorious figure in the movement, but I, I, I moved in the highest circles of anthroposity without being a member. And one of the words I came across when I was studying the Christocentric doctrines of the Middle Ages was this word, perichoresis, perichoresis. And actually, that word has the word dance in it, because kora means dance, okay? And perichoresis, get nice. this, you're going to love this as a biblical scholar. It means the reciprocal inherence of the divine and human natures of Christ in each other. So that is the kind of conceptual construct that centuries of theologians put together in order to try to get this idea that Jesus Christ is a human divine hybrid, right? And that right. persists today as a very strong belief, you see? But we have a big problem in the world today, my friend. And that problem is transhumanism. Oh, indeed. Now, if you look at Elon Musk, mm. If, if you can stand to look at him or just actually avert your eyes and listen to what he says, Elon Musk says, not only can we create a hybrid between a human animal and AI, 
a, a, a combined neural network, we will plant AI in your brain and you will function partly as a human being and partly as an archontic being, artificial intelligence. Not only can we do that, we're going to do that. He says this many times, right? Indeed. Well, my observation as an Gnostic is that that is simply another way of saying, yes, there is a divine human hybrid, and now you can be one. Oh, that's brilliant, John. That's brilliant. I, I haven't cognitively made that connection, but that's, that's brilliant. And that's a great way to sell it to the sheep. And also, it's like you can become the six million dollar Christian. You know, there, old there you go. Lee there, Majors there. reference. There you go, the six million dollar Christian. And not only that, but transhumanism, as you see it in the world today, which I consider to be a great evil. It's the archontic mindset at its ultimate. Has the same origin as Abrahamic ideology of Christ. It's the Absolutely. same mythology. If you spin it in the direction of science, you get Elon Musk. If you spin it in the direction of religion, you get Billy Graham or all the evangelists who obviously, I think, believe that Jesus was divine. Virgin born, right? Yes, sir. There's a supernatural event, right? The virgin birth. So they're actually offering for those that are willing a religious salvation for those that are not willing for that, they, they can offer up a technical salvation or a technology salvation. Yeah, the technocratic salvation wow. is to become united with AI. And that is, it may look different, but it's just the same as the salvation offered from the divine human hybrid of Jesus. It is, and I'm reminded of the, the Borg on Star Trek when they say you will be assimilated and only a, a crazy star trekker trek you would know this but the full statement is that the borg would say you will be assimilated and we will add your distinctiveness to our own and everybody's going to be better for it and i think there'll be very much a a similar sales pitch being made to uh, those of us here in this hologram it's the same program rebranded for today. And what it leads to is the hive mind of the archons. Which the, the, hive, the Borg are a brilliant analogy of. Brilliant analogy, one of the best that comes out of sci-fi. You know, the top scholars who compiled the Nag Hammadi writings and translated them, one of them observed that, uh, Gee, it's funny about this Gnostic mythology, but it seems to be describing a sci-fi scenario. And it does. We are in a sci-fi scenario. The more I learn about Gnosticism, and it's funny, John, because, you know, it's got to be at least five, six, maybe seven years ago that you and I first crossed paths. And I, I can't remember what it's about, but I think we had a little argument. And the fact of the matter is, I just kind of put Gnosticism on the side, but to be honest and to be objective, six, seven years ago, I wasn't ready for the knowledge and the deep truths involved in many of the things you teach. And as the old saying says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And sometimes it's the same teacher. <laughs> well, we're fortunate that we've crossed paths. And yes, I can assure you that Gnosticism, Gnostic knowledge, not Gnosticism, that's the past, the Gnostic movement, right. that's over. The living Gnosis today is high voltage. I can assure you, when you get on that line, it's high voltage coming through. And it blows away all of that delusional indulgence in which the human animal likes to indulge because there is a tendency. We are children. We are like a childlike species. Therein lies our innocence and our beauty, and we love to play, and we love to pretend, but that tendency of pretending goes into illusion and delusion very easily. And the Gnostic is someone who trains the mind to use the power of imagination correctly 
and not to go into make believe and pretending. And I, I, you, you have said this on one of our shows and every day it becomes more real to me. And it, I'm, maybe I'm paraphrasing you, but I remember you saying that Gnosticism or the Gnostic truth is the antidote to the salvationist message. And even if you didn't say it, I think you're right. Yeah, I think I did say that. Mm -hmm. It is the antidote. That is to and say it may that. be the only effective antidote, John Lamb Lash. Well, as far as I know, it is. You yeah. know, I've studied uh, all other. I've studied Hinduism. I've studied Buddhism. I can guarantee you Buddhism ain't the antidote. Buddhism ain't the antidote to nothing. It's right. certainly not the antidote to suffering, even though Buddhism is entirely based on the concept of suffering. And in that respect, it's a parallel to Christianity because Christianity is all about suffering and escape from suffering. Absolutely. See? Yeah, it places, I've said this and not in his image, and it's one of the most powerful lines I've ever written. The problem with the trap, with the victim, victim syndrome, which is inherent to the malware of Judeo-Christianity, is that it makes the force of suffering looks stronger than the life force itself. Why is Jesus so important? It's because he took upon himself the suffering of the world. Why do you have at the core of your religion, Catholics particularly, the image of a man being tortured on a cross? Why don't you have the image of a man dancing with stars behind him as the symbol of your religion. Now that would be a beautiful thing. Well, I can show you that thing, my friend. And I did show you because I sent you a link to a new block of uh, units. I call them units, lessons on Nemata. Oh, yeah, and, indeed. <clears throat> did, did you see it? Did you open I it? I did. Up? I didn't open it, but I saw it. All right. Can I tell a short story? Take me four minutes. John, you're <laughs> in charge tonight. We, we're waiting with bated breath for whatever you have to say. Well, right after Not In His Image came out in November 2006, I was living up in Belgium. And I took the high-speed train with my friend, my best friend, over to Paris. And I went to the... Uh, National Library of Paris, uh, which contains a section that contains some of the rarest uh, medieval manuscripts in the world. And I went there specifically to investigate what is called the Paris Eadwine Psalter. Now, Psalter is like a prayer book, right? Mm -hmm. And this artifact is a one of its kind. There's only one in the world, and it's in this library. And of course, I couldn't get to it because I'm not a qualified scholar with connections, but I could. I went into a booth and I looked at the microfiche. <clears throat> so I went there with a specific purpose. I had noticed for a number of years that certain medieval manuscripts were illustrated with pictures of magic mushrooms. Hmm. Many people have noticed this. There's a, right. a tremendous amount. And I thought, this is really interesting. There are biblical scenes that are uh, in uh, illumined manuscripts of the Middle Ages and then later on, uh, for instance, showing Adam and Eve in a mushroom garden. Oops, here we go again. Wow. Right? Yeah. It's known that the Gnostics in the mysteries used mushroom potions and they used fermented barley, which is equivalent of LSD, fermented barley, for their rituals. They used what are called psychoactive or entheogenic potions. This is verifiable. This is not, not making this up. So I thought, well, it would do me well to know more about this now. I'm going to go investigate this Eadwine Psalter, E-A-D-W-I-N-E. -E. In uh, Middle English or Saxon, it means benevolent friend. So obviously, it was a very expensive project, this book. 
It's about 300 pages long and it's lavishly illustrated. So there had to be a sponsor, someone who paid the money to have it done. And that, that was called Eadwine. So that's why it's, so I go and I look, <laughs> I'm sitting in this booth, I'm rolling and rolling the microfilm. I'm, I'm finding these outrageous pictures. They're all on Nemata, you can see them, of scenes of mushrooms. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus standing up on a hill with people, a crowd gathered around him, and among the people are people-sized mushrooms. Oh, my. You know, did Jesus deliver the Sermon on the Mount, you know, tripping on LSD or psilocybin mushrooms? You know, there you go with all those kind of stories, right? Right. So, of course, I am absolutely stunned. And I'm flipping through it and I'm flipping through it. And then I come to the section which describes the same thing that Lydia was talking about from the Acts of John. Oh, it's showing Maundy Thursday. It's showing the so-called Last Supper scene. But what are these pictures showing? Oh, wait a minute. One of them shows Mary Magdalene. Uh, she's always pictures that a redhead, redhead, by the way, mm -hmm. kneeling in front of the table and offering a bowl to Jesus. And what could be in that bowl? Well, if you blow it up and look at it closely, it could be mushrooms or it could be maybe the, the bomb in the alabaster jar. So I thought, wow, here is graphic confirmation in this medieval manuscript that goes back to the Acts of John, which is an apocryphal text. But hold on, it gets better. I rolled the screen down one more frame, and there is the picture of Jesus and Mary Magdalene dancing. Wow. And as far as I know, you correct me, this is the only image I have ever seen in Christian art that shows Jesus dancing. I've never seen one that shows him dancing. And he's not dancing alone. That's amazing. You know, being, is, a, yeah. being a Pentecostal preacher, John, there was a time back in the, I think it was in the early 90s where this whole thing went around the country. <clears throat> called sacred dance and they had people dancing in church and of course it, it might have started out in a, a spiritual remembrance of something pure but when they let's just say that when they started dancing in church they didn't just stop there so yeah well that's ended that's the trouble with uh biblical boogie woogie <laughs> like to get out of control no lydia my avatar uh teaches sacred dance and sacred dance involves ritual moves with the hands and the body. It's a way of invoking the feeling of the divine. It's a way of melting down into your Kundalini flow in your body. You know, you have Kundalini flowing through your cells. It's a way of getting into that deep, sweet melt, which is of course the melt of sex, but you can have sex when you're dancing. You know, it's it's very sexual. It gives you the same bliss. So in the art of sacred dance is, is an art of bliss. And uh, this is very ancient and exists in many, many cultures. You see, that's images from the Balinese culture where sacred dance still survives today. In India, you have the Bharatanatyam, the sacred dance. The American Indian tribes, uh, the Pueblos in the Southwest, have attended their dances. They're absolutely monumental dances that they dance in snake-like lines. They pound the earth rhythmically with their, with their feet. And after 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you go into that sound and you know that that's the sound of the earth. They're like pounding the earth like a drum. I mean, all of this tradition of sacred dance is very widespread. Uh, and it reminds me of you talking last time about uh, Pan dancing and being jovial and happy and 
frolicking and we've just we've we've given up so much and it's time to reclaim it in my opinion yeah we've given up our true animal pleasures and delights we and have. look at what's happening today as a consequence of giving them up oh. we now can't even have them we're being punished in such a way by the covid psyop that you can't dance you can't sing you can't shout hallelujah at thanksgiving dinner because you might be spreading a virus i mean this is insane and this is where it goes when we are alienated from our natural desires which are pure like the desire of a child they only become corrupted by human influences but in and of themselves they are pure you see absolutely Absolutely. That's one of the most evil, vile things about Christianity is that it teaches that we're born with original sin. And I don't know if I've shared this with you, John, but where my first my first revelation was when I was holding my oldest daughter in my arms and I looked at her and this is right in the delivery room. And I said, there's no way in hell that this being is filled with original sin. And I knew that something was terribly wrong right then. Unfortunately, my integrity wasn't where it should be, and it took me probably another four years before I extricated myself. But you know, they were there was a there was going to be a lot of month left at the end of the money if I if I just walked away. There's an extraordinary book. It's called uh, something like uh, the Inner Life of an Infant, and it's written by uh, a highly accredited developmental psychologist. Now, developmental psychology is the specific branch that studies the development of a human being, of its mind, emotion, and moral qualities from infancy into adulthood, okay? It's specifically uh, targeted on that subject. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the link to the book. It's absolutely amazing. Please. And he describes... Uh, how they set up experiments with infants. Of course, they weren't invasive experiments. It wasn't clinical. They did it very respectfully. But they set up situations where they could observe infants at the age of five days or five weeks or five months. And they very cleverly arranged these experiments so that they could detect to some degree what the inner world of the infant was, okay, at that age. I tell you, I can't even paraphrase what they found. Basically, at one point, he concluded that the human child is born in an illumined state. Absolutely. Yeah. And that it has, from the age of five, psychic faculties, which we would now call, if you and I had them, they would be occult powers that it can detect things, it can sense things, it can sense the world around it. And this is all pre-verbal. Indeed. <clears throat> now this gets back to the figure of Jesus and the question of the supernatural character of Jesus. And this is something that I have a huge, uh, I have a big beef with this as a Gnostic. Here's where you get my hardline Gnosticism again. Well, I've been waiting for it, John. <laughs> Would it be fair to say that there are two prevailing images of Jesus Christ that linger and loom in human imagination? One of them is, well, there are three. One of them is, let's work backwards. The image, no, there are four. There's the resurrected Christ. Then go back, there's the Christ on the cross, the tortured Christ. Then go back to Jesus Christ, the teacher, in the yep. three years, right? And then go back to the infant in the manger. Mm. So they're, they're sort of telescoped together, aren't they? It's like a set of lenses. If I sit back and I say, okay, I'm going to let my imagination go to what I've been told, and I'm going to picture Jesus Christ, and then these pictures come up, the child in the manger, 
the young teacher baptized, and then the three years of walking among the people in Palestine, then the Savior on the cross, the big supernatural act of redemption, and then the risen Christ. They're all a set of lenses, right? Who installed those lenses in your mind? Why do you see Ooh. Jesus in that way, right? Are those archontically installed, John? Well, rather than give you my hardline opinion on that, let's just talk it through for a bit and see okay. what comes up naturally in the course of the conversation. For instance, take the image of the Christ child in the manger. Oh, there you go. Christ child. Mm. Well, what is the Christ child? child what is that supposed to be that's a figure of human imagination i would point something out by the way uh that well-known image which is reproduced uh you know in christmas scenes although you can't do that anymore because the zenosh who are running the show would not allow that because that's white racist stuff to have a you know a white child oh is it a white child or is it a sephardic jew or what is it you know anyway that scene comes out of pagan legend the christians didn't invent the scene of the christ child in the manger there is a legend in the middle east where the hebrews lived and christianity arose that says that there was a goddess figure, and all goddesses figure point back to the earth goddess, Sophia, and she fell in love with a shepherd named Dumuzi. I think this is an Arcadian myth, a legend. And the story says that Dumuzi, the shepherd, when he was tired and weary at the end of the day, Maybe he had spent the day in the company of the goddess. Maybe he had spent the day out with his sheep or his goats. Would go into the manger. It was a soft bed and comfortable, and he would sleep in the manger. So the early Christians who were constructing the narrative of Jesus, the legends of Jesus, I would call them, took this myth and they transposed it into their narrative so people today believe that that is unique to Christianity. It is not. It is taken from another script. Follow me? Absolutely. I'm right with you. So I'm going to ask you again, because I don't talk to Christians. I mean, when you see the Christ child in the manger, well, that's a supernatural event in itself because that infant was born by a virgin birth, not the normal act of sex, right? Not the normal act of sex, for sure. Right. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, this is my question. What's the difference between someone like Jeffrey here looking at his newborn child looking into those eyes, seeing that innocence and that perfection, and looking at the iconic image of the Christ child in the manger. Hmm. Is that what people see when they see the Christ child? They see what you saw looking at your child. Is that what they see? You know, I'm not sure, John, if that's what they see or not. I... I... I almost want to say no, that's not what they see. It's a good question, isn't it? I, it is. I think it costs yeah. you to ponder. My assumption is that of those four aspects, those four lenses, that one is the lens that people look to in order to give them a sense that there is some kind of innocence and perfection in humanity Oh. And if they can't find it in themselves, they project it out to that and they idealize that image. Yeah, that's actually brilliant, John, because if you're taught that you've got original sin and if you were born to filthy, dirty, rotten and worthy of burning in hell forever, at least Jesus wasn't. And we can gaze upon that Christ child and 
see someone born without original sin. And if we align ourselves with him and make the list and check it twice and know who's naughty or nice, then maybe we can avoid the uh, eternal damnation and maybe get a back corner up in this place they called heaven or something. Bingo. Bingo, my friend. You have hit it. You see, I submit to you that anyone who cannot find in themselves that innate sense of the primal, pure, childlike, innocent goodness of humanity will project what they don't have. That's what narcissists do. It's called narcissistic deprivation. The narcissist is a black hole. The narcissist is obsessed with themselves, but they don't actually have a self to be obsessed with. It's a great dilemma. Wow. So, uh, yeah, right. So out of that black hole, oh, I, I can't feel it in myself, but I know it existed in one special instance. And so if I attach myself to that, somehow by association, I will reclaim or claim that sense because I can't find it on my own. That's the problem. And my wow. statement to you is, if you can't find that innate humanity on your own, then you don't have it and you're in big trouble. And that's why, one of the reasons why there's such a powerful connection to that Christ imagery, mm. because you can show them, they can see it in the text, see it in their own text. But John, to some of these people, if they admit that this Christ child did not exist in the way that they think he did, then they're left with nothing but the black hole of their own empty soul. And I, I'm reminded of, of Tombstone, you know, uh, Doc Holliday's lying in the bed, feigning sickness. Wyatt Earp is getting ready to go out and have a gunfight that he knows he's going to lose. And Wyatt Earp says, what does he want? And Doc says, revenge. And he's like, revenge for what? And Doc says, for being born. A man like <laughs> that's got a deep, empty hole in the middle of him. You're my huckleberry. Wow. <laughs> wow. Not that I'm gonna not that I'm gonna shoot you down, but <laughs> the fact is that Gnostic Intel shoots it all down. And it will take you Christians down to the core of your, your humanity. And if you can't claim it you're, as your own, not given to you by the sources you are give to which you give your faith, then you're in for a hard row. But fortunately, there is a place to go. There is a place to find that connection to the divine in yourself and in the external world. Absolutely. And John, if you don't have that connection, are you what we might term an NPC? And even if you're faking the connection, does that still not make you NPC-like? Indeed. <clears throat> you are an NPC. You are an archontic zombie. There we go. Like all these people wearing masks and muzzles, you see. And it's a tragic fate for humanity. And we are living in the moment of the apocalypse. And it is the moment. It's do or die, folks. It is the moment to face this fate that humanity is under threat of, of absolute perdition yes. due to this transhumanist program, which, as I've said, and I can't emphasize it enough, is nothing but a scientific technological version of Abrahamic salvation. That's brilliant. And you mentioned tonight in the talk I listened to something hopefully we'll talk about at some point. You mis mentioned a very fascinating subject that had to do with two R's and I'll make sure I get them right. One was um, retaliation and one was reparations, right? Yeah. You know, the old meme of three R's reading, writing and arithmetic. Well, I maintain that in this event that's happening now, which Gnostics consider to be Sophia's correction. This is a great concept from Gnosticism. The right. correction of the illusions of the world, the correction of the evil deceit of the archons. Okay. It's being corrected. And uh, the three R's of correction go like this. 
what's the world going to look like when the criminal system comes down, when the criminal psychopaths running the system are defeated? What's the world going to look like in the beauty to come? First R, restoration. You'll see the restoration of all the good, simple, decent things that people have always done for each other, working together, supporting each other, having businesses, traveling, meeting other people, a restoration of sane normality. Mm. Okay, that's the first thing. We do go back to that. The second thing is reparation. That means that all the untold billions of dollars and all the land and all the assets that is currently in the hand of the criminal psychopaths is claimed from them. It's taken from them. And that wealth and that those resources are redistributed into society. And everyone, for instance, who has suffered the loss of their business through this PSYOP and this con, which is a complete lie, will have reparation in abundance to rebuild their lives, rebuild their businesses, get their homes back, rebuild our lives with the resources that are taken from the predators. It has to be taken from them by violence. They will never give it up voluntarily. And then the third is retaliation. Because if that is really possible, that we can really make this passage, humanity has never made such a passage before through such a trial and succeed. Some of those predators and parasites are still going to be around. And what are we going to do with them? Are we going to forgive them and invite them back into the fold of the sane and decent people in the world? I'll leave that as an open question. Mm. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't. And I think vengeance is mine. If, I, lamb, if right? I choose it, yeah. You can get the lamb or you can get the lash, but you're going to get one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> John, just uh, I, I don't know if you have any more that you have prepared to tell us about. I'm hoping you do. But being where you are, as opposed to where we are in the United States, do you have more or less hope for Europe generally than you do for us over here in the United States? I have different. I don't have hope, but I have different confidence. Oh, good. I have the confidence that it will break to the advantage of truth. Excellent. Yeah, I said years ago, I did this uh, long event on the Internet. It's called the Gaian Navigation Experiment. Mm -hmm. It went on for three years. And something I said in that was, look, if Sophia's correction that was predicted by the Gnostics is happening now, and I have proven that it is, and it continues to unfold, then humanity is going to take its role in her correction. She doesn't do it alone. We do it with her. We restore the earth and human relations to what they are meant and intended to be so that people can thrive and live together. You know, as long as you do not harm or deceive anyone else, you can do whatever you like. That's the fundamental law, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, uh, so I said, and, and so we're having a dialogue with my friends and students, all my students are my friends. And uh, they said, well, how are we going to know when the tide turns? And I said, when the advantage goes to truth, that's when the tide turns. When the advantage goes to truth. For instance, last Saturday, there were hundreds of thousands of people in London doing, doing just that. They weren't protesting. They were just going out as you would normally do. That's restoration. Uh, and the BBC didn't even report on it. Not a word. Boy, of course not. Of course not. John, is there anything else that we've uh, not touched on the conversation with Lydia and Justin? Justin? Yeah, there is. Uh, there's one more thing. And I would uh, 
introduced this as a teaser to some Christians. You know, go and invest. I don't know. These books are expensive. I pay hundred, two hundred dollars for some of these books. They're not for everybody. I don't know. The New Testament Apocrypha is just dazzling. Hmm. These two two thick volumes of four hundred pages each. <clears throat> but let's go back for a moment to the Acts of John. And that relates to a passage. What you find in the Acts of John can also be found in a Gnostic Testament, a Gnostic document called the Gospel of Philip. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, because it's called the Gospel of Philip, doesn't mean that it was written by Philip as people know Philip from the New Testament. You know, that's a mistake. So there is a passage in... Uh, the Acts of John, that goes back to John. And it says, well, I'm giving you the paraphrase because I want to do it quickly. So John says, well, I was at Golgotha, and the crowd was there. And there he was up there on the cross, and they were torturing him. He was bleeding and, you know, nailed. Oh, horrible. I couldn't stand it. I ran away. <clears throat> this is in the text. And I went and hid in a cave in the dark because I was just overwhelmed, you know. And it was vile and disgusting, and I didn't want to watch it. And he said, and lo and behold, Jesus came to me in the cave. And he said, what are you doing here? And I looked at him, and I said, well, I, I couldn't stand looking at you up there on the cross. And Jesus said, well, I'm not there. That's just an hallucination. Hmm. I'm actually here with you now. And he said, you see those people out there? They are seeing something, but they are not seeing reality. And I will show you what reality is. And so there's a long passage in the Acts of John where uh, Jesus in the cave shows him this field of white light, which is the organic light, Yes, you could say. And he shows him that there is a cross in the light. But it's not the cross with a long bottom to crucify. It's not the torture instrument. It's the cross of the divine powers of the universe. The four-armed um, cross. You know, John, I never realized that Christianity had corrupted that. <clears throat> yeah. Just like now. Like the swastika. Exactly like the swastika. Very well yeah. put. The swastika is a four-armed spinning cross, which represents the galactic center, the source of life. It's one of the most beautiful sacred symbols in the entire world. It's something that is accepted by people who love life and nature and what it is to really be human and be connected to our source. So he showed him this huge cross, and he gave them a teaching. And then he said... <clears throat> And uh, here I'm quoting. He said, uh, John said, when he had spoken unto me of these things, because he says, now I reveal to you a mystery. The mystery is what is really true. What is happening out there on the hillside is a nightmare that is not true. Right? When he had spoken unto me these things and others which I know not how to say, as he would have me say them, he was taken up not one of the multitudes ever having seen his real appearance. And when I went down, I laughed them all to scorn, inasmuch as he had told me the things which they said concerning him. So the Gospel of Philip picks up on this theme, and it goes even further. There's a passage in it uh, which, which says that even the figure on the cross was laughing was laughing at the illusion and sickness of all the people that were making that into the sadistic drama that it is. And there you find the meme of the laughing Jesus. And there's a whole book been written about that. The author is John Dart. And the book is called The Laughing Jesus or The Laughing Savior. And this is in the apocryphal Christian tradition. Not in the canonical. Just imagine if, and I've wondered through my life, uh, wow, I mean, if, if Christians could get some of this stuff, how would it affect them? You know, would it 
snap them out of it? I don't know. I really don't. It makes me wonder if more people saw that representation of the dancing Jesus and heard about this story that you're talking about. It may well be a different world. Totally different world. You know, there is some truth in the New Age uh, saying that we, you know, we create our own reality. Uh, I like to modify that. I say, yeah, we do create our own reality, but our own reality is not just ours alone. Our own reality, your life is not yours alone. This is a Gnostic teaching. Your life exists within her life. It exists mm -hmm. within the dreaming of the Aeon Sophia. So with her, in recognition of her as the divine mother, you, you see her as your divine mother in the same way that you would sit across the dinner table and look at your own real biological mother. You don't imagine her, you see her. Wow. She's real, she's biological, she's material. And so we co-create our reality with her greater reality. And certainly if we know how to do that correctly, using mind and imagination and sex correctly, we create an utterly different world. That's the beauty to come. And I have no doubt that it is indeed coming. No doubt at all. Yeah, I feel it more every day. And I want to add one more point, and then let's just let's just jam freely for a moment. Okay. In the in the beauty to come, in this future I love that, world. I love that saying. Yeah, it's well, it's you can taste it, can't you? I can. Mm -hmm. Well, so many people can, and they respond beautifully to me on YouTube and elsewhere. Look. I have to say something that's going to sound puzzling, but it's really important. The Abrahamic creator God, if you profile him along lines of criminology, is a psychopath, a paranoid, psychotic, and a genocidal maniac who is cruel, very, very cruel. So this COVID psyop is cruel. You know, don't these people wearing masks and not being allowed to live normally, don't they ever get the creeping sense that they're being punished? You know, they would have to. And, you know, I just as you said, that, I've often thought and I don't know if I've ever verbalized it, but the God of the Bible <clears throat> is like Hannibal Lecter without the charm. There you go. <laughs> you come up with some great stuff. I've been wanting to have a conversation with some witty character like you for so long now. <laughs> we're, we're doing great here. So my point is, and this is a big one, I ask you to reflect on this. In the beauty to come, there is no punishment. So I'm going to talk personally now, just from my own inner sense. I don't see any sense in punishing someone. Uh, what does it serve? All these people are in prison. All these people, what is the point of punishment? Uh, I can see the sense in murdering someone. I can see a lot of sense in that <laughs> if the situation requires it, right? You know, if, there's someone, you. if there's someone in a schoolyard, you know where I'm going, Yep. Uh, and starts to do, you know what, I won't say. I don't see, I wouldn't have any hesitation at all to kill him dead on the spot. So murder and ending someone's life, by the way, is not punishment. See, the term capital punishment is ridiculous. If you kill someone, you're not punishing them. If you want to punish someone, well, chain them to, uh, you know, chain them to a median strip uh, in a, on a freeway and let them die and rot. That's punishment. But I don't have any taste for punishment. There's no punishment in the beauty to come, but there is retaliation. John, you just said, let me just jump in. You just said that there's no punishment in the beauty to come. And how can there ever be a beauty in a universe that is going to be eternally plagued by this place that is full of about, by my reckoning, at least 98% of the people that this fallen, failed 
phony God ever created are burning, not burning up, John. The Lake of Fire, they don't burn up, as you know. They burn right. forever and ever and ever and ever. There can be no beauty to come in a world where that is going to be a part of it. Well, you're right on the mark there, Jeffrey. I gave a talk. It's one of my most popular talks. It's had tens of thousands of uh, listenings. It's called The Tragedy of the Mother, mm. meaning the Divine Mother, right. planet Earth. She's your mother, right? That's a supernatural presence. You're in the presence of the supernatural all the time in, na in nature. <clears throat> and in this, I open with this question. Do you believe that any divine being, superhuman, who could create this world that you're in with the creatures in this world, including yourself, and be capable of punishing those creatures? Do you believe that? Do you believe that a being who had the power to make all this happen, to put us here, to give us humans some special or unique role that we need to discover by inner development, what our role is, and present us with every opportunity. Give us a miraculous body. Give us the so-called immune system. Give us our mind and our senses, our talents, our love for beauty, our affection for each other, our sense of mutual aid. Give us all these beautiful qualities and the many beautiful qualities in the animal world. Do you believe that a divine being who has the power to create all that would punish the subjects of that world? I, I, that, you know, that's where, that's the question to me. That's the yep. fundamental question. You know, Henry Ford once said that thinking is the hardest work there is. That's why there's so few people that do it. Where is the virus of common sense? Where is the virus of common sense? If you love a dog or a cat or another human being, then your common sense tells you what is best for them and best for yourself. Common sense and your sense of moral goodness are the same. And yeah, if we can gather together and talk, in our basic humanity, not relying on some doctrinal uh, Boom, that's it. paradigm, but looking at ourselves and into ourselves, then we come quite easily to the common sense of human nature, and that is our salvation. Absolutely, 100%. John, you said something in the talk I listened to tonight, and I was wanted to ask you if I got the chance, and since we're just jamming a little bit, you said – and it was an offhanded statement, but you made some a, a statement to the effect of um, if you could see me or if you could at least see this, our, I think you said our contact uh, Im impression of me or something along those lines. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, well, we're so used to these iconic devices, the iPhone, the Internet, the Zoom and all of these things. I have nothing against AI technology in and of itself. What I object to is not setting rigorous limits on it. Mm. That's the problem. You know, there's a saying in the narrative of the Aeon Sophia, when the Lord Archon, the Aldabaoth, arose and he appeared and Sophia herself saw him. This is all happened before the earth. She turned into the earth. And then she saw the horde of the Archons and then the, reptilian overlord she there's a passage i think it's in on the origin of the world it says that and he did not abide in the place where he was set so when she saw the danger of them she set them in a place which is called the stereoma it's a greek word and that's translated by biblical scholars as the firmament so she put them in the firmament, that is to say, in, a, in an enclosed area. But hmm. he did not abide the boundaries of the place where he was set. That's the problem with AI. It's all over the place. It's in your face. And it has, in the last, what, 30 years, when did people start using cell phones? The 90s? 
Yeah, I think about the 90s. Yeah, it became those. popular. Mm -hmm. They had walkie-talkies and things like this. We are There are generations who are born into this. They've never known the world without smartphones and computers. And consequently, they can't tell plastic from pearl. They, you know, mm -hmm. they think that, yeah, they're hearing my voice. You're not hearing my voice. You're hearing an archontic duplication of my voice. I'm not seeing you sitting there moving your head, nodding. I'm seeing an archontic replication. Replication is the power of the archons. Yeah, how, how, virtual reality, replications. That's how they take us over. They bring us to the point when AI is not kept within limits where people can't tell the difference between uh, a reproduction or replication and the real thing. Wow. John, it's been another amazing, amazing discussion. Is there anything else bouncing around between your ears right now that you feel needs to come out here in the, in the remaining moments? Yeah, I would just like to leave the audience uh, something to reflect on. Let's get back to this image of the Christ child. So the way the narrative of biblical theology develops is that that pure and innocent child in the manger ends up tortured oh. on the cross, right? Okay, follow me now. Oh, that's the narrative, right? Well, isn't that funny? Isn't that strange? Because I'm living in 2021, and wow, I do hear a lot of rumors about children being tortured. Oh, wow. I wonder if there's any connection. There's absolutely a connection. You, you know there, there is. is. Right. Yeah, I know. It's it's horrifying. And the so, thing that really bothers me, John, is they've sold the whole world on this idea that, well, it's just a few bad priests. It's just a few bad preachers. <clears throat> I contend, from my knowledge of this, that it is not just a few bad apples. It is absolutely endemic within the salvationist religion, and in fact, you could even call it, um, what are the rituals that they call? It's part of their sacraments. Yes, it is apparently a sacrament of the globalist parasite predators. Absolutely. And on that, on that note, here's a message from the Gnostic hardliner. Here's a soundbite. Christianity is a religion Judaism and Christianity are religions based on child sacrifice. And the evidence of it is there in the scriptures that they accept. Mm -hmm. What is the action that creates the bond between Abraham, who was chosen by Melchizedek to represent the archonic powers in the, and to be their proxy and their agents? What is the connection that affirmed his mission? Well, to prove that he was obedient to God, he had to do what? Sacrifice a child. That's right. Then fast forward to the New Testament. And what is the great glorious message of redemption all about? It's about the sacrifice of a child in his man, in his manhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I rest my case. John, here's something that came to me one day. You're one of the few people I'll really be able to fully appreciate this. I'm reading in the Gospels, and they, you know, I'm, you know, the, everybody talks about the story of Jesus saying, Oh, no, let the children come. Let the children come unto me. Let them sit on my lap. Let them come. And I, I went back and I read that, and I'm like, There's at least four places in the New Testament where people are saying, Don't let Jesus have your kids. Don't let Jesus have your kids. Don't let your kids get around Jesus. And Jesus is like, No, no, no. Let them come. Let them come. Let them come. John, maybe that's another thing where I say, is that Gnostic sabotage? Don't let your kids go to this. It's not a good thing. Uh, maybe it's just common sense leaking through that horrible, contrived Flavian comic book story. Absolutely. About the Superman who comes, uh, you know, through the virgin birth and then sacrifices his life. Uh I don't I don't go for sacrifice, you know, no. not in that sense, at least. No. So these are we're getting to the core here. And uh, I would like the takeaway of this to to go out to the world 
with the question, well, examine yourself, look within. And do you have something that you would call a sense of your own humanity? Well, I think you would. Many people would say, yes, I have it. I can't exactly define it. It's a feeling, right? It's an intuition. But it's what I feel when I look at myself and when I look at other human beings, I see my kind, I see my species, and I have that sense of humanity, right? Well, great. But can you also examine what you have been taught and told about your sense of humanity that mm -hmm. might be wrong. It might be entirely wrong. You see, if you place your sense of humanity in that figure of Jesus Christ, you are in a way betraying your own humanity by doing that. And that is a hard, hard lesson. But that is the fundamental lesson that liberates Christians into another way of seeing the world and another way of seeing humanity. It's the only way. It's a hard, painful, terrible lesson, but it's so liberating. John Lamb Lash, where can people get in touch with you and avail themselves of your priceless information? Well, as you know, Not In His Image is coming out in the summer, in the 15th anniversary, and I've made some significant revisions in it. We were talking earlier about how I made mistakes. I had a Christocentric spin for a long time, and the new edition, compared to the first edition, uh, actually shows how I corrected myself. Hmm. And I like people to know that, you know. Uh, I don't know everything. But what I do know, I know in a certain manner. I know it in a certain manner, which is provable, you see. So if you want to uh, get the first edition, you can get it from Chelsea Green, uh, directly from the publisher. The place where I would direct people to is uh, sophianicmyth.org. It's one word. And there you have an introduction to the fallen goddess scenario which is the narrative of the mysteries and the Gnostic teachers. And you can get one episode of it every four or five days by subscribing free. And you can read the story. And also someone now is recording those episodes and they will also be available in a spoken form. So you can listen to it if you prefer. Uh, so that's where you begin if you want to learn about the narrative of your divine mother. Uh, and apart from that, Nemata is the school, the Sophianic School of Arts and Sciences. You're a member now. Yes, sir. And there is an enormous amount of material on Nemata. It has 12 courses, such as Sophianic Cosmology, Gnosis Today, uh, Kali Yuga. It's like, a, it's like a university. Just go and wander around the campus and sample the things and see if anything appeals to you. Those are the three places to find me, as well as the YouTube channels, John Lamb Lash and Mandela Effect Decoded. Excellent. John, thanks so much for being here. I'm looking forward already to next Friday night. These are absolutely amazing. Yeah, and in the Gnostic jargon, we have a lot of jargon, you know. Uh, so we say, the creep don't rise. <laughs> the creep being Eldabaoth, the demented I, alien god. <laughs> I got it. Who I lovingly refer to as the rat bastard. The rat bastard. Okay, Jeffrey, thank you so much. I'll sign off for this evening and we'll see you again around the bend. <laughs>